So this is a Liverbox recording. Um, I when I was um, uh, put on hold from posting anything from uh, YouTube. Um, uh, this is one of the books I I did remember to go back and pull up um, that I listened to um, because it, um, it actually started with the, there's another book and I'm gonna see if I can find it but it was the history of Canada it skipped North America Canada um, Mexico and the West Indies and when they were describing some of the stuff there um, and the people when in Mexico, um, it had my imagination going. You already know how I feel that um, the Yucatan, um, and especially like the Belize area, the Yucatan, it fits the uh, Maccabees, uh, the second Maccabees, uh, the end of the uh, book where the last of the Maccabees, he built seven pyramids, one for his father, his mother, and all of his brothers. And the verse says, in some translation, it says that the pyramids can be seen from ships and the other one says that the pyramid can be seen from the shore so i went around looking for seven pyramids that can be seen by ship or by shore of course i indulged myself with those that believe in that place over there they call israel and um you know they didn't have a you know seven pyramids over there which you know was just to cover all basics ba bases i'm sorry and then uh i searched for um what was that other place? Um, oh, I looked around um, in Africa. Um, nothing. And that's when I, I started looking at Mexico because I know they said there was tons of pyramids and mounds. And um, I mean, they say they're in America, but I know they said in Mexico because I had also read that article that there was over 300 mounds in Nicaragua. But we never hear anybody talk about that. None of these, uh, you know, pro... Um, um, Afrocentric, you know, um, that claim the Olmec, you know, um, being, you know, the, the link between Africa and here. And it's like, no one talks about these mountains. Well, why? Why is it that the only thing I've read about them is that, you know, Canadian archaeologists and, and are the only ones digging through them right now. So who knows what they're finding and what they won't tell you that they found. But, I mean, that might be the negative way to look at it, but I mean, it could be the Smithsonian, Smithsonian, that could be worse, right? It could be them. We'll never know if they pull that stuff out of there. So, but I just wanted to play some of um, the first chapter here because I thought some of this was interesting um, right off the bat because it, it blows, it, it takes the narratives that we've been taught, you know, and, and blows them out of the water. Like, um, my first job, my, um, well, my second job, I was working at a store in uh, South Carolina, and there was a lot of people from Honduras and Ecuador there, and not to look like me, but you know, look like the people that are there today. Um, and um, I learned Spanish from them, and I thought it was really cool because it was like um, they're like you're learn actually learning Spanish because they said American Spanish is that it's American and it's watered down ver a version. Like the, the further south you go into Central and South America, the the closer your Spanish gets to its origin. So they said, I'm getting a really good version of Spanish, you know. Um, and other people I spoke to um, would say the same thing. And I, I remember asking them, um, one lady, she just stopped and she heard me speaking Spanish to another lady, Norma. And uh, she's like, hey, you speak really good. Are you from, um, are you from uh, El Salvador? And I'm like, no. I'm like, why? I'm thinking, why would you even ask that, you know. You know, and uh and she's like, oh, she's like, are you from the islands? I'm like, no, you know, I mean, so I asked Norma, why would she even ask that? Because, I mean, I, I was like 16 or 17 at the time. And, uh, yeah, she explained that, you know, that um, a lot of the people there look like me. And a lot of people there speak Spanish. They don't, she's like, they don't speak African. So I thought, you know, that's, I'm like, that was, um, that was interesting. But in my mind, I'm still brain trained to think, hey, that. That just they're just Africans brought over here and they you know learn to speak Spanish, but I want you to listen to this, because like Vincent always says, you can't have it both ways. I'm gonna stop rambling now. Section one of incidents of travel in Central America, Chiapas, and Yucatan, Volume One. 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sue Anderson. Incidents of Travel in Central America, Chiapas, and Yucatan, Volume 1, by John Lloyd Steffens. Section 1, Preface. The author is indebted to Mr. Van Buren, late President of the United States, for the opportunity of presenting to the public the following pages. He considers it proper to say that his diplomatic appointment was for a specific purpose not requiring a residence at the capital, and the object of his mission being fulfilled or failing, he was at liberty to travel. So that's in the, that was one of the things I have at the top of that, my, my mind right there, right? So President Van Buren, it, it gives one a uh, reason to look in to see what did uh, he de, uh, deduce from this man's journey about the uh, Central America, right? What did he write about it? What did what 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 is he spoken about? You know, I mean, it would probably be all heavily edited, but you know, still, you know, he allowed this expedition. So, at the time of his arrival in Central America, that country was distracted by a sanguinary civil war which resulted during his sojourn there in the entire prostration of the federal government. By the protection and facilities afforded by his official character, he was enabled to accomplish what otherwise would have been impossible. His work embraces a journey of nearly 3,000 miles in the interior of Central America, Chiapas, and Yucatan, including visits to eight ruined cities, with full illustrations from drawings taken on the spot by Mr. Catherwood. Its publication has been delayed on account of the engravings, but on one consideration the author does not regret the delay. Late intelligence from Central America enables him to express the belief that the state of anarchy in which he has represented that beautiful country no longer exists. The dark clouds which hung over it have passed away. Civil war has ceased, and Central America may be welcomed back among republics. New York, May 1841. Chapter 1. Departure. The Voyage. Arrival at Belize. Mixing of Colors. Government House. Colonel MacDonald. Origin of Belize. Negro Schools. Seen in a courtroom, law without lawyers, the barracks, excursion in a pit pan, a beginning of honors, honors accumulating, departure from Belize, suites of office. Being entrusted by the president with a special confidential mission to Central America, on Wednesday, the 3rd of October, 1839, I embarked on board the British brig Mary Ann. Hampton, master, for the Bay of Honduras. The brig was lying in the North River with her anchor a peak and sails loose, and in a few minutes, in company with a large whaling ship bound for the Pacific, we were under way. It was before seven o'clock in the morning. The streets and wharves were still. The battery was desolate, and at the moment of leaving it on a voyage of uncertain duration, seemed more beautiful than I had ever known it before. Opposite the quarantine ground, a few friends who had accompanied me on board left me. In an hour, the pilot followed. At dusk, the dark outline of the highlands of Neversink was barely visible, and the next morning we were fairly at sea. My only fellow passenger was Mr. Catherwood, an experienced traveler and personal friend who had passed more than ten years of his life in diligently studying the antiquities of the old world, and whom, as one familiar with the remains of ancient architectural greatness, I engaged immediately on receiving my appointment to accompany me in exploring the ruins of Central America. Hurried on by a strong northeaster, on the ninth we were within the region of the trade winds, on the tenth within the tropics, and on the 11th, with the thermometer at 80 degrees, but a refreshing breeze, we were moving gently between Cuba and Santa Domingo, with both in full sight. 
For the rest, after eighteen days of boisterous weather, drenched with tropical rains, on the twenty ninth we were driven inside the lighthouse reef, and avoiding altogether the regular pilot ground, at midnight reached St. George's Bay, about twenty miles from Belize. A large brig loaded with mahogany was lying at anchor with a pilot on board, waiting for favorable weather to put to sea. The pilot had with him his son, a lad about sixteen, cradled on the water, whom Captain Hampton knew and determined to take on board. It was full moonlight when the boy mounted the deck and gave us the pilot's welcome. I could not distinguish his features, but I could see that he was not white, and his voice was as soft as a woman's. He took his place at the wheel and, loading the brig with canvas, told us of the severe gales on the coast, of the fears entertained for our safety, of disasters and shipwrecks, and of a pilot who, on a night which we well remembered, had driven his vessel over a sunken reef. At seven o'clock the next morning we saw Belize, appearing, if there be no sin in comparing it with cities consecrated by time and venerable associations, like Venice and Alexandria, to rise out of the water. A range of white houses extended a mile along the shore, terminated at one end by the government house, and at the other by the barracks, and intersected by the river Belize, the bridge across which formed a picturesque object, while the fort on a little island at the mouth of the river, the spire of a Gothic church behind the government house, and groves of coconut trees, which at that distance reminded us of the palm trees of Egypt, gave it an appearance of actual beauty. Four ships, three brick. And there it is again, something about that, you know, it reminds you, when, when you go back and read the book of Maccabees, and the second one, especially, and you're, you know, or, and you're picking out things to look up as far as land and stuff like that. Like I said, the last one I said that, um, the last of the Maccabees built seven pyramids along the coast, right? Or well, some translations say they can seen, but they can be seen from ships. Others say they can be seen from the coast. And Belize and the Yucatan is the only place that I've found so far where you can see seven pyramids from the from the shoreline or from the coast, because one's even on an island. Now, so. Thanks. Sundry schooners, bungos, canoes, and a steamboat were riding at anchor in the harbor. Alongside the vessels were rafts of mahogany. Far out, a negro was paddling a log of the same costly timber, and the government dory which boarded us when we came to anchor was made of the trunk of a mahogany tree. We landed in front of the warehouse of Mr. Coffin, the consignee of the vessel, there was no hotel in the place, but Mr. Coffin undertook to conduct us to a lady who he thought could accommodate us with lodgings. The heavy rain from which we had suffered at sea had reached Belize. The streets were flooded, and in places there were large puddles, which it was difficult to cross. At the extreme end of the principal street we met the lady, Miss... And think about it, right? They said the Nero paddled out in a boat with uh, mahogany trees on it. Now, if you were brought over here to the Americas as slaves, right? Because they say, oh, 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 more slaves are brought to Central and South America than to North America. Well, then you got to ask that question, right? What was this slave master? What was he doing just paddling out with, with, with mahogany trees as if he was going somewhere to sell them? Dash, a mulatto woman who could only give us board. Mr. Coffin kindly offered the... Wait, wait, wait. So, so their guy takes him to a mulatto woman who owns her own house, right? During a time where there's supposed to be a, a division because of skin color, right? How does she end up owning her own house? You are of the condition of the mother. That's what they tell you, right? Use of an unoccupied house on the other side of the river to sleep in, and we returned... By this time, I had twice passed the whole length of the principal street, and the town seemed in the entire possession of blacks. The bridge. What? 
a time during slavery, a time during civil war in the Americas, right? A time during uh, 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 racial division, they called it. You're telling me there's a town in Belize that's ran by nearly all blacks? How is this possible? Where is the slave master? Where is the slave overlord? You can't have it both ways, as Vincent would say it, right? You can't be the slave that was brought over here in harsh, cruel conditions, but at the same time, you run your own town during the time that you're supposed to be enslaved. Would you all just freely walk off the, the plantation and start your own town, and the slave master said, hey, there's too many of you. There's nothing we can do about it. The marketplace, the streets and stores were thronged with them, and I might have fancied myself in the capital of a Negro republic. They were a fine-looking race, tall, straight, and athletic. Wait, wait, isn't that what they describe the uh, uh, Calusa Indians of Tampa, Florida, and Clearwater, right? Tall, well-built, sturdy, you know, uh, good warriors of fierce continents. With skins black, smooth, and glossy as velvet, and well-dressed, the men in white cotton shirts and trousers with straw hats, and the women in white frocks with short sleeves and broad red borders and adorned with large red earrings and necklaces. And I could not help remarking that the frock was their only article of dress and that it was the fashion of these sable ladies to drop this considerably from off the right shoulder and to carry the skirt in the left hand and raise it to any height necessary for crossing puddles. Now, On my way minute. back. Wait a minute. How can you be dressed in some of the finest clothes, right? And you're in a black republic. While, uh, while they're, you know, just think about it, right? They say uh, Belize is, is British controlled and operated. Operated, I'm sorry. I can't even talk. See, this is how, this is how it gets to me, right? Because, I mean, think about it. How can you write all this stuff and then years later say, oh, you're slaves, you were brought over here, you came from nothing, you had nothing, look at you, you're struggling. It makes no sense whatsoever that you could have books like this out here and you can still have people look you in the face and tell you, oh, you all came here from Africa. <laughs> During that time, this was going on. I stopped at the house of a merchant whom I found at what is called a second breakfast. The gentleman sat on one side of the table and his lady on the other. At the head was a British officer and opposite him a mulatto. On his left was another officer and opposite him also a mulatto. By chance a place was made for me between the two colored gentlemen. Some of my countrymen perhaps would have hesitated about taking it, but I did not. Both were well-dressed, well-educated, and polite. There it is again. Well-dressed, well-educated. Who's educating you? You were brought here to be slaves, not to be well-dressed and educated people. This can't... It, it doesn't work this way. It can't work. It doesn't work this way. They talked of their mahogany works, of England, hunting, horses, ladies, and wine. Mahogany works, isn't that a, a, a craftsman in, 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 in England? What would you know about England? You're from Africa, right? And, 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 and that doesn't make any sense. That makes no sense. And before I had been an hour in Belize, I learned that the great work of practical amalgamation, the subject of so much angry controversy at home, had been going on quietly for generations, that color was considered mere matter of taste, and that some of the most respectable inhabitants had black wives and mongrel children whom they educated. See, now there's what caught me, right? When it said black wives and mongrel children, now that made me think the editor might have took some liberties to their own liking. <laughs> Because it almost made me think that if this is a, a, a um, what would you call it here? If this is a, a black run republic, and that's what he's more shocked by. But yeah, he's describing the fact that the black run republic, had, that they would have black wives and mongrel children. See, I'm almost thinking he's, that there they switched it up. That they're saying these black dudes 
have the same situation that you see like in Africa, right? Where these dudes get into high positions and then they get a white wife and then they have those, uh, their, their children. Because I've never heard a mulatto described, maybe I'm, I might be wrong, but I've never heard of a mulatto described as being a mongrel. I've only heard of, 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 of Europeans using that term to describe their own children with as much care and made money for with as much zeal as if their skins were perfectly white. I hardly knew whether to be shocked or amused at this of so much angry controversy at home had been going on quietly for generations. That color was considered mere matter of taste and that some of the most respectable inhabitants had black wives and mongrel children whom they educated with as much care and made money for with as much zeal as if their skins were perfectly white. I hardly knew whether to be shocked or amused at this condition of society and in the meantime joined Mr. Catherwood to visit the house offered by Mr. Coffin. It was situated on the opposite side of the river and the road to it was ankle deep in mud. At the gate was a large puddle, which we cleared by a jump. The house was built on piles about two feet high, and underneath was water nearly a foot deep. We ascended on a plank to the sill of the door, and entered a large room occupying the whole of the first floor, and perfectly empty. The upper story was tenanted by a family of Negroes. In the yard was a house swarming with Negroes, and all over in the yard and in front were picturesque groups of little Negroes of both sexes, and naked as they were born. We directed the room to be swept and our luggage brought there, and as we left the house we remembered Captain Hampton's description before our arrival, and felt the point of his concluding remark that Belize was the last place made. We returned, and while longing for the comfort of a good hotel, received through Mr. Goff, the Consul of the United States, an invitation from His Excellency, Colonel MacDonald, to the Government House, and information that he would send the Government Dory to the Brig for our luggage. As this was the first appointment I had ever held from Government, and I was not sure of ever holding another, I determined to make the most of it and accepted at once His Excellency's invitation. There was a steamboat for Isabel, the port of Guatemala, lying at Belize, and on my way to the government house I called upon Senor Comillano, the agent, who told me that she was to go up the next day, but added with great courtesy that, if I wished it, he would detain her for a few days for my convenience used to submitting to the despotic regulations of steamboat agents at home, this seemed a higher honor than the invitation of His Excellency. But not wishing to push my fortune too far, I asked a delay of one day only. The government house stands in a handsome situation at the extreme end of the town, with a lawn extending to the water and ornamented with coconut trees. Colonel MacDonald, a veteran six feet high and one of the most military men I ever saw, received me at the gate. In an hour the dory arrived with our luggage, and at five o'clock we sat down to dinner. We had at table Mr. Newport, chaplain, and for fifteen years parish clergyman at Belize, Mr. Walker, secretary of the government, and holding besides such a list of offices as would make the greatest pluralist among us feel insignificant, and several other gentlemen of Belize, office holders, civil and military, in whose agreeable society we sat till eleven o'clock. The next day we had to make preparations for our journey into the interior, besides which we had an opportunity of seeing a little of Belize. The Honduras Almanac, which assumes to be the chronicler of this settlement, throws a romance around its early history by ascribing its origin to a Scotch buccaneer named Wallace. The fame of the wealth of the New World and the return of the Spanish galleons laden with the riches of Mexico and Peru 
brought upon the coast of America hordes of adventurers, to call them by no harsher name, from England and France, of whom Wallace, one of the most noted and daring, found refuge and security behind the keys and reefs which protect the harbor of Belize. The place where he built his log huts and fortalice is still pointed out, but their site is now occupied by warehouses, strengthened by a close alliance with the Indians of the Mosquito Shore and by the adhesion of new... That's another one I had to stop and look up. The uh, Indians of Mosquito Shore. Funny enough, I didn't find anything uh, interesting. I figured that there would be a trace of something that would lead to uh, what they uh, what they actually look like. Numerous British adventurers who descended upon the coast of Honduras for the purpose of cutting mahogany, he set the Spaniards at defiance. Ever since, the territory of Belize has been the subject of negotiation and contest, and to this day, the people of Central America claim it as their own. It is grown by the exportation of mahogany, but as the trees in the neighborhood have been almost all cut down, and Central America is so impoverished by wars that it offers but a poor market for British goods, the place is languishing and will probably continue to dwindle away until the enterprise of her merchants discovers other channels of trade. At this day, it contains a population of 6,000, of which 4,000 are blacks, who are employed by the merchants in gangs as mahogany cutters. Did you hear that? 6,000 is what he claims is what, you know, is what's uh, uh, inhabiting there. 4,000? That only leaves 2,000 to be something else, right? Quote unquote white, mulatto, Indian, right? And African. Because uh, you'll see as, as this goes on, those are some of the other ones he describes. There's Indians. Oh, there's niggers. There's um, Africans. There's whites and mulattoes. So that other 2,000. <laughs> It's not all white people. So don't, don't imagine that when, when, when you hear that. Their condition was always better than that of plantation slaves, even before the act for the general abolition of slavery throughout the British dominions, they were actually free. Hear and that? Hear that? Those two thousand, oh, sorry, those 4,000 people were already free before the abolishment of the slavery in the, for, the, for the British. Now, how can that be? How can that be possible? <laughs> right? But we know how it's possible because they weren't the ones that were enslaved. Slaves were someone else, right? You know, we already know the etymology of slaves. Slaves but it takes you back to Slavs, the Slavics of the Ukraine. The, well, most of the Ukrainian people would claim to be Jews today, right? <laughs> you know, look at most of Mexico. Look at the leaders of most of Mexico. They all claim to have Jewish ties. Was it Benjamin Netanyahu? You know, he's supposed to be related to the president of, of, of Israel. You know, uh, uh, um, what was it? Was it the mayor or, yeah, the mayor of Mexico City, right? She's all crying. I I want to be known for my politicians, you know, my, my, my politics, and not my uh, ethnicity. You know, <laughs> come on, man. You know, <laughs> the whole the abolishment for slavery wasn't about these people. Obviously, if they're living free before the, the slavery is supposed to be abolished, at least British slavery. And on the thirty first of August, eighteen thirty nine, a year before the time appointed by the Act. By a general meeting and agreement of proprietors, even the nominal yoke of bondage was removed. The event was celebrated, says the Honduras Almanac, by religious ceremonies, processions, bands of music, and banners with devices. The sons of Ham respect the memory of Wilberforce. The you see, that's where I, I, I need the book, because it sounds like she said the sons of Ham respect the event was celebrated says the honduras almanac by religious ceremonies processions 
bands of music and banners with devices. The sons of Ham respect the memory of Wilberforce. See that? The sons of Ham respect the memory of Wilberforce. That's another thing we need to look up. The Queen, God bless her, MacDonald forever, civil and religious liberty all over the world. Nelson Shaw, a snowdrop of the first water, continues the almanac, advanced to His Excellency, Colonel MacDonald, and spoke as follows. On the part of my emancipated brothers and sisters, I venture to approach Your Excellency to entreat you to thank our most gracious Queen for all she has done for us. We will pray for her, we will fight for her, and if it is necessary, we will die for her. We thank Your Excellency for all you have done for us. God bless Your Excellency. God bless Her Excellency, Mrs. MacDonald, and all the royal family. Come, my countrymen, hurrah! Dance, ye black rascals. The flag of England flies over your heads, and every rustle of its folds knocks the fetters off the limbs of the poor slave. Hubaboo, Cochalaram, G. The Negro schools stand in the rear of the government house, and the boys' department consisted of about 200 from 3 to 15 years of age, and of every degree of tinge from nearly white down to two little native Africans, bearing on their cheeks the scars of cuts made by their parents at home. These last were taken from on board a slave ship captured by an English cruiser, brought into Belize, and, as provided for by the laws, on a drawing by lot, fell to the share of a citizen who, entering into certain covenants for good treatment, is entitled to their services until they are 21 years old. Now, isn't that interesting? Because isn't that the same kind of uh, time frame that you have for the Social Security account, right? He turned. Oh no, I no, I'm getting it confused. There's another um, f scratch that. There's something else I was. Uh, I, I've got to share with you. Um, it's connected to the uh, turning 21 in, in your Social Security account. But uh, never mind. Scratch that. Unfortunately, the master was not present, and I had no opportunity of learning the result of his experience in teaching. But in this school, I was told, the brightest boys and those who had improved the most were those who had in them the most white blood. The mistress of the female department had had great experience in teaching, and she told us that, though she had had many clever black girls under her charge, her white scholars were always the most quick and capable. From the Negro school... So what they're saying is, uh, um, plain and simple, their so-called white students were able to, what, memorize and regurgitate the lessons faster and more accurately. You know, that's one of the things that I learned from that um, that Charlotte lady, the one whose uh, dad was work, worked for the skull, or was a member of the Skull and Bones, and uh, she was showing that the Skull and Bones manipulates the whole uh, school systems. And um, she points out that schooling, when she came back from Europe, that the United States school system is not really about teaching you um, how to think. It teaches you what to think. It teach, it, they test you on how much you memorize and how fast that you can regurgitate it and recall it. See, thinking takes time, right? And it's a process, you know, to, to, to work through all of the, the pits and downfalls to come up with a good conclusion to things. But if you already been told what to think and never question it, then, yeah, you'd be a good student to have. Because you'll never have to stop and take breaks because you'll, you'll always be able to tell them what they've told you and, and they'll always be correct then. Well, we went to the Grand Court. It had been open about half an hour when I entered. On the back wall, in a massive mahogany tablet, were the arms of England. On a high platform beneath was a large circular table around which were heavy mahogany chairs with high backs and cushions. The court consisted of seven judges, five of whom were in their places. One of them, Mr. Walker, 
invited me to one of the vacant seats. I objected on the ground that my costume was not becoming so dignified a position. He insisted, and I took my seat in a roundabout jacket upon a chair exceedingly comfortable for the administration of justice. As before remarked, five of the judges were in their places. One of them was a mulatto. The jury was impaneled, and two of the jurors were mulattoes. One of them, as the judge who sat next to me said, was a sambo, or of the descending line, being a son of a mulatto woman and a black man. I was at a loss to determine the caste of a third, and inquired of the judge, who answered that he was his, the judge's brother, and that his mother was a mulatto woman. The judge was aware of the feeling existing in the United States with regard to color, and said that in Belize there was, in political life, no distinction whatever, except on the ground of qualifications and character, and hardly any in social life, even in contracting marriages. I so 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 that's the thing, right? That's the thing, right? Where are all the the the, the people you see today? Where are all those people that you know you would say today are are from Central America? Why is this a, a big issue between the whites? that are coming in and the so-called blacks that are already there are you noticing the narrative here are you noticing he's not saying oh there's you know there's a there's a mexican i, I hate to sound so you know vulgar when i describe it this way but you know think about it right they're not describing anybody else in these situations it's like the all the population here was already here that it was hey these people we call negro these people that we now call black you know they're here and uh yeah you're intermixing with uh the the, the people that are supposed to come over here to um assess how things are going and then set up a plan to Take what you have, you know, and that's not supposed to happen because if that happens, if you're practicing, you know, uh, Martin Luther King's uh, love, right, amore, right, uh, you're the, the whole plan to steal everything from you. It, you're taking the people that we we're hoping that would steal it from you, converting them to, to you, right? Right. And, and now we don't have now we've got to come up with a way to put something that stops that that block there because we're losing the people we're sitting over here. That's supposed to steal from you. That's why there was such a big problem with it. You're losing the people who are supposed to know here to steal from you there. It's like it's like when you, you, you go through harsher, you know, through, through, through urban areas today. Right. Or you go through low poverty areas today. You know, how much relationships you see between uh, low class blacks and whites that live together. Like, that's the separation that they were trying to avoid. Because you're supposed to be over here taking what the, what the so-called blacks have, not living with them. And they see, that's his astonishment. <laughs> I had noticed the judges and jurors, but I missed an important part of an English court. Where were the gentlemen of the bar... Some of my readers will perhaps concur with Captain Hampton that Belize was the last place made when I tell them that there was not a single lawyer in the place and never had. Oh, listen to that. See, see, he's all about those things that help them steal everything from you. He's all he's shocked because he wants to see the same system they have set in place in Britain and in the United States. He wants to see it in Belize and he can't believe he cannot help well, he cannot believe that Belize is functioning fine and is a good trading post without all these things. And it's being run by, what, 4,000 blacks? The, you, you can hear it. You just hear the way he writes. You can tell. He's just, he's not, he's not for it. How can you have, how can you have court without lawyers? Well, that's some. Hold on, hold on. That's something I've been learning about was that uh, the way the Constitution was set up, you weren't supposed to have lawyers. You weren't even supposed to have a judge. You're supposed to have the sheriff, right? You're supposed to have the person that, I forget what it's called, that, that writes down what happens in that court case. And then you have your jury, right? That are supposed to judge, that are supposed to hear the facts, right? And hear the testimonies and then decide guilty, not guilty. Ask the lawyer what is the punishment if guilty or not guilty, you know, or guilty. 
and things of that nature, and then come up with an answer from there. Had been, but lest some of my enterprising professional brethren should forthwith be tempted to pack their trunks for a descent upon the exempt city, I consider it my duty to add that I do not believe there is the least chance for one. As there is no bar to prepare men for the bench, the judges, of course, are not lawyers. Of the five then sitting, two were merchants, one a mahogany cutter, and the mulatto, second to none of the others in character or qualifications, a doctor. This court is the highest tribunal for the trial of civil causes, and has jurisdiction in all amounts above fifteen pounds. Belize is a place of large commercial transactions. Contracts are daily made and broken or misunderstood, which require the intervention of some proper tribunal to interpret and compel their fulfillment. And there was no absence of litigation. The calendar was large and the courtroom crowded. The first cause called was upon an account when the defendant did not appear and a verdict was taken by default. In the next, the plaintiff stated his case and swore to it. The defendant answered, called witnesses, and the cause was submitted to the jury. There was no case of particular interest. In one, the parties became excited, and the defendant interrupted the plaintiff repeatedly, on which the latter, putting his hand upon the shoulder of his antagonist, said in a coaxing way, "'Now don't, George. Wait a little. You shall have your turn.' Don't interrupt me, and I won't you. All was done in a familiar and colloquial way. The parties were more or less known to each other, and the judges and jurors were greatly influenced by knowledge of general character. I remarked that regularly the merits of the case were so clearly brought out that when it was committed to the jury, there was no question about the verdict, and so satisfactory has this system proved that, though an appeal lies to the Queen in Council, as Mr. Evans, the foreman, told me, but one cause has been carried up in twenty-two years. Still, it stands as an anomaly in the history of English jurisprudence, for I believe in every other place where the principles of the common law govern, the learning of the bench and the ingenuity of the bar are considered necessary to elicit the truth." At daylight the next morning I was roused by Mr. Walker for a ride to the barracks. Immediately beyond the suburbs, we entered upon an uncultivated country, low and flat, but very rich. We passed a race course, now disused and grown over. This is the only road opened, and there are no wheel carriages in Belize. Between it and the inhabited part of Central America is a wilderness, unbroken even by an Indian path. There is no communication with the interior except by the Golfo Dulce or the Belize River, and from the want of roads, a residence there is more confining than living on an island. In half an hour we reached the barracks, situated on the opposite side of a small bay. The soldiers are all black and are part of an old Jamaica regiment most of them having been enlisted at the English recruiting stations in Africa. Tall and athletic, with red coats, and on a line bristling with steel, their ebony faces gave them a peculiarly warlike appearance. They carry themselves proudly, call themselves the Queen's Gentlemen, and look down with contempt upon the niggers. We returned to breakfast, and immediately after, made an excursion in the government pit pan. All these years later, that attitude's never changed. This is the same fashion of boat in which the Indians navigated the rivers of America before the Spaniards discovered it. European ingenuity has not contrived a better, though it has, perhaps, beautified the Indian model. Ours was about 40 feet long and six wide in the center, running to a point at both ends and made of the trunk of a mahogany tree. Ten feet from the stern and running forward was a light wooden top, supported by fanciful stanchions, with curtains for protection against sun and rain. It had large cushioned seats, 
and was fitted up almost as neatly as the gondolas of Venice. It was manned by eight Negro soldiers, who sat two on a seat with paddles six feet long, and two stood up behind with paddles as steersmen. A few touches of the paddles gave brisk way to the pit pan, and we passed rapidly the whole length of the town. It was an unusual thing for His Excellency's pit pan to be upon the water. Citizens stopped to gaze at us, and all the idle Negroes hurried to the bridge to cheer us. This excited our African boatmen, who, with a wild chant that reminded us of the songs of the Nubian boatmen on the Nile, swept on... I think about that too, the way they describe that, the Negroes versus the Africans, right? He's describing it as two sets of people here, right? Because if the, if the Negroes that were, uh, that were, what do you say, that were just doing nothing but hanging around idly were Africans, why don't we just call them both Africans? Why is he describing one as Negroes and the Africans on the boat with them all right, are different? under the bridge and hurried us into the still expanse of a majestic river. Before the cheering of the Negroes died away, we were in as perfect a solitude as if removed thousands of miles from human habitations. The Belize River, coming from sources even yet but little known to civilized man, was then in its fullness. On each side was a dense, unbroken forest. The banks were overflowed. The trees seemed to grow out of the water, their branches spreading across so as almost to shut out the light of the sun and reflected in the water as in a mirror. The sources of the river were occupied by the aboriginal owners, wild and free as Cortez found them. We had an eager desire to penetrate by it to the famous Lake of Peten, where the skeleton of the conquering Spaniard's horse was erected into a god by the astonished Indians. But the toil of our boatmen reminded us that they were paddling against a rapid current. We turned the pit pan, and with the full power of the stream, a pull stronger and a chant louder than before, amid the increased cheering of the Negroes, swept under the bridge, and in a few minutes were landed at the government house. In order that we might embark at the hour appointed, Colonel MacDonald had ordered dinner at two o'clock, and, as on the two preceding days, had invited a small party to meet us. Perhaps I am wrong, but I should do violence to my feelings did I fail to express here my sense of the Colonel's kindness. My invitation to the government house was the fruit of my official character, but I cannot help flattering myself that some portion of the kindness shown me was the result of personal acquaintance. Colonel MacDonald is a soldier of the Twenty Years' War, the brother of Sir John MacDonald, Adjutant General of England, and cousin of Marshal MacDonald of France. All his connections and associations are military. At 18, he entered Spain as an ensign, one of an army of 10,000 men of whom in less than six months, but 4,000 were left. After being actively engaged in all the trying service of the Peninsular War, at Waterloo he commanded a regiment, and on the field of battle received the Order of Companion of the Military Order of the Bath from the King of England, and that of Knight of the Order of St. Anne from the Emperor of Russia. Rich in recollections of a long military life, personally acquainted with the public and private characters of the most distinguished military men of his age, his conversation was like reading a page of history. He is one of a race that is fast passing away and with whom an American seldom meets. But to return, the large window of the dining room opened upon the harbor. The steamboat lay in front of the government house and the black smoke rising in columns from her pipe gave notice that it was time to embark. Before rising, Colonel MacDonald, like a loyal subject, proposed the health of the Queen, after which he ordered the glasses to be filled to the brim, and standing up he gave the health of Mr. Van Buren, President of the United States, accompanying it with a warm and generous sentiment, 
and the earnest hope of strong and perpetual friendship between England and America. I felt at the moment, cursed be the hand that attempts to break it, and, albeit unused to taking the President and the people upon my shoulders, I answered as well as I could. Another toast followed to the health and successful journey of Mr. Catherwood and myself, and we rose from table. The government dory lay at the foot of the lawn. Colonel MacDonald put his arm through mine and, walking away, told me that I was going into a distracted country, that Mr. Savage, the American consul in Guatemala, had on a previous occasion protected the property and lives of British subjects, and if danger threatened me, I must assemble the Europeans, hang out my flag, and send word to him. I knew that these were not mere words of courtesy, and in the state of the country to which I was going, felt the value of such a friend at hand. With the warmest feelings of gratitude, I bade him farewell, and stepped into the dory. At the moment, flags were run up at the government staff, the fort, the courthouse, and the government schooner, and a gun was fired from the fort. As I crossed the bay, a salute of thirteen guns was fired. Passing the fort, the soldiers presented arms. The government schooner lowered and raised her ensign, and when I mounted the deck of the steamboat, the captain, with hat in hand, told me that he had instructions to place her under my orders and to stop wherever I pleased. The reader will perhaps ask how I bore all these honors. I had visited many cities, but it was the first time that flags and cannon announced to the world that I was going away. I was a novice, but I endeavored to behave as if I had been brought up to it, and to tell the truth, my heart beat and I felt proud, for these were honors paid to my country and not to me. To crown the glory of the parting scene, my good friend Captain Hampton had charged his two four-pounders, and when the steamboat got under way, he fired one, but the other would not go off. The captain of the steamboat had on board one puny gun, with which he would have returned all their civilities, but, as he told me to his great mortification, he had no powder. The steamboat in which we embarked was the last remnant of the stock in trade of a great Central American Agricultural Association, formed for building cities, raising the price of land, accommodating emigrants, and improvement generally. On the rich plains of the province of Vera pa You hear that? It does everything but bring slaves. Brings immigrants, trade, grab land, everything but bring the slaves to, Africa, to to Central America. Think about that. As they had established the site of New Liverpool, which only wanted houses and a population to become a city. On the wheel of the boat was a brass circular plate, on which, in strange juxtaposition, were the words Vera Paz, London. The captain was a small, weather-beaten, dried-up old Spaniard, with courtesy enough for a dawn of old. The engineer was an English... And they think about it, that's the first time so far in this book that they've made mention of Spaniards. Think about it, up until this point, it's been nothing but black, 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 mulatto, mulatto, African, Negro, black, mulatto, white, African, Negro. Man and the crew were Spaniards, Mestizos, and Mulattoes, not particularly at home in the management of a steamboat. Our only fellow passenger was a Roman Catholic priest, a young Irishman who had been eight months at Belize and was now on his way to Guatemala by invitation of the Provisor by the exile of the Archbishop, the head of the church. The cabin was very comfortable, but the evening was so mild that we took our tea on deck. At ten o'clock, the captain came to me for orders. I have had my aspirations, but never expected to be able to dictate to the captain of a steamboat. Nevertheless, again as coolly as if I had been brought up to it, I designated the places I wished to visit and retired. Verily, thought I, 
If these are the fruits of official appointments, it is not strange that men are found willing to accept them. Chapter 2 Everyone for Himself Traveler's Tricks Puente Gorda A Visit to the Carib Indians A Carib Crone A Baptism Rio Dulce Beautiful Scenery Isabel Reception of the Padre A Barber in Office A Band of Invincibles Parties in Central America A Compatriot A Grave in a Foreign Land Preparations for the Passage of the Mountain a road not macadamized, perils by the way, a well-spiced lunch, the mountain passed. We had engaged a servant, a French Spaniard, Santo Domingo born and Omoa bred, bearing the name of Augustine, young, and as we at first thought, And doesn't that sound like he said Omoa bred? Like all those titles, but it is pedigree, what is... More? More bite? The mountain passed. We had engaged a servant, a French Spaniard, Santo Domingo born and Omoa bred, bearing the name of Augustine, young, and as we at first thought, not very sharp. Early in the morning he asked us what we would have for breakfast, naming eggs, chickens, etc., we gave him directions, and in due time sat down to breakfast. During the meal, something occurred to put us on inquiry, and we learned that everything on the table, excepting the tea and coffee, belonged to the padre. Without asking any questions or thinking of the subject at all, we had taken for granted that the steamboat made all necessary provisions for passengers. But to our surprise learned that the boat furnished nothing, and that passengers were expected to take care of themselves. The padre had been as ignorant and as improvident as we, but some good Catholic friends whom he had married, or whose children he had baptized, had sent on board contributions of various kinds, and among other things, odd luggage for a traveler, a coop full of chickens. We congratulated the Padre upon his good fortune in having us with him and ourselves upon such a treasure as Augustine. I may mention, by the way, that in the midst of Colonel MacDonald's hospitalities, Mr. Catherwood and I exhibited rather too much of the old traveler. When at dinner the last day, Mr. C. was called from table to superintend the removal of some luggage, and shortly after I was called out. And fortunately for Colonel MacDonald and the credit of my country, I found Mr. C. quietly rolling up to send back to New York a large blue cloak belonging to the Colonel, supposing it to be mine. I returned to the table and mentioned to our host his narrow escape, adding that I had some doubt about a large canvas sack for bedding, which I had found in my room, and presuming it was the one that had been promised me by Captain Hampton, had put on board the steamboat. But this, too, it appeared, belonged to Colonel MacDonald, and for many years had carried his camp bed. The result was that the Colonel insisted upon our taking it, and I am afraid it was pretty well worn out before he received it again. The reader will infer from all this that Mr. C. and I, with the help of Augustine, were fit to travel in any country. But to return, it was a beautiful day. Our course lay nearly south, directly along the coast of Honduras. In his last voyage, Columbus discovered this part of the continent of America, but its verdant beauties could not win him to the shore. Without landing, he continued on to the Isthmus of Darien, in search of that passage to India, which was the aim of all his hopes but which it was destined he should never see. Steamboats have destroyed some of the most pleasing illusions of my life. I was hurried up the Hellspont, past Sestos and Abydos, and the plain of Troy, under the clatter of a steam engine, and it struck at the root of all the romance connected with the adventures of Columbus to follow in his track, accompanied by the clamor of the same panting monster." 
Nevertheless, it was very pleasant. We sat down under an awning. The sun was intensely hot, but we were sheltered and had a refreshing breeze. The coast assumed an appearance of grandeur and beauty that realized my ideas of tropical regions. There was a dense forest to the water's edge. Beyond were lofty mountains, covered to their tops with perpetual green, some isolated and others running off in ranges, higher and higher, till they were lost in the clouds. At eleven o'clock we came in sight of Puente Gorda, a settlement of Carib Indians about a hundred and fifty miles down the coast, and the first place at which I had directed the captain to stop. As we approached, we saw an opening on the water's edge with a range of low houses, reminding me of a clearing in our forests at home. It was but a speck on the great line of coast. On both sides were prime evil trees. Behind towered an inextraordinary mountain, apparently broken into two like the back of a two-humped camel. As the steamboat turned in, where steamboat had never been before, the whole village was in commotion. Women and children were running on the bank, and four men descended to the water and came off in a canoe to meet us. Our fellow passenger, the padre, during his residence at Belize, had become acquainted with many of the Caribs, and upon one occasion, by invitation from its chief, had visited a settlement for the purpose of marrying and baptizing the inhabitants. He asked whether we had any objection to his taking advantage of the opportunity to do the same here, and, as we had none, at the moment of disembarking, he appeared on deck with a large wash hand basin in one hand and a well-filled pocket handkerchief in the other containing his priestly vestments. We anchored a short distance from the beach and went ashore in the small boat. We landed at the foot of a bank about twenty feet high and ascending to the top came at once under a burning sun into all the richness of tropical vegetation. Besides cotton and rice, the cahoon, banana, coconut, pineapple, orange, lemon, and plantain, with many other fruits which we did not know even by name, were growing with such luxuriance that at first their very fragrance was oppressive. Under the shade of these trees most of the inhabitants were gathered, and the padre immediately gave notice in a wholesale way that he had come to marry and baptize them. After a short consultation, a house was selected for the performance of the ceremonies, and Mr. Catherwood and I, under the guidance of a Carib who had picked up a little English in his canoe expeditions to Belize, walked through the settlement. It consisted of about five hundred inhabitants. Their native place was on the sea coast below Trujillo, within the government of Central America, and having taken an active part against Morazan, when his party became dominant, they fled to this place, being within the limits of the British authority. Though living apart as a tribe of Caribs, not mingling their blood with that of their conquerors, they were completely civilized, retaining, however, the Indian passion for beads and ornaments. The houses or huts were built of poles about an inch thick, set upright in the ground, tied together with bark strings, and thatched with coroon leaves. Some had partitions and bedsteads made of the same materials. In every house were a grass hammock and a figure of the Virgin or of some tutelary saint, and we were exceedingly struck with the great progress made in civilization by these descendants of cannibals, the fiercest of all the Indian tribes whom the Spaniards encountered. The houses extended along the bank at some distance apart, and the heat was so oppressive that, before reaching the last, we were about to turn back. But our guide urged us to go on and see one old woman, his grandmother. We followed and saw her. She was very old. No one knew her age, but it was considerably over a hundred. And what gave her more interest in our eyes than the circumstance of her being the grandmother of our guide, she came from the island of St. Vincent the residence of the most indomitable portion of her race, and she had never been baptized. 
She received us with an idiotic laugh. Her figure was shrunken, her face shriveled, weazened, and wicked. And she looked as though in her youth she had gloried in dancing at a feast of human flesh. End of section one.